call this meeting to order and recognize that tonight's meeting is being held on the traditional territory of the Sinaimo people. I also want to let everybody know that uh, Trustee Higginson is on the phone with us tonight. Uh, before we get started, today, Canada's, today Canada celebrates National Aboriginal Day. This is a day for all Canadians to recognize and celebrate unique heritage, diverse cultures, and outstanding contributions of First Nations, Inuit, and Métis people. The Canadian Constitution recognizes these three groups as Aboriginal peoples, also known as Indigenous peoples. Although these groups share many similarities, they each have their own distinct heritage, language, cultural practices, and spiritual beliefs. In, in cooperation with Indigenous organizations, the Government of Canada chose June 21st, the summer solstice, for National Aboriginal Day. Day. For generations, many Indigenous peoples and communities have celebrated their culture and heritage on or near this day due to the significance of the summer solstice as the longest day of the year. So, thank you for that. Uh, transfer of items to the open meeting agenda. Any transfer of items? Seeing none. Any additions to the agenda? Seeing none. Any deletions to the agenda? Seeing none. Any change in the order? Seeing none. Any objection to the approval of the agenda? Seeing none. Any objection? Okay, the approval of the minutes. 7.1. Uh, the Board of Education of School District 68 adopt the minutes from the regular board meeting held May 24th, 2017. Any objection? Uh, the Board of Education of School uh, minutes of May 10th. Uh, the Board of Education of School District 68 adopt the minutes from the business committee committee meeting held May 10th, 2017. Does anybody have any objection? We talked about this at the last meeting. Uh, and uh, there was a concern of an attendance issue, but the tape's been verified. So the original minutes were correct. Does anybody have any objections? Seeing none. Uh, the section 72 report. That uh, 8.1, uh, that the section 72 report from the closed meeting uh, be received. Does anybody have any objection to that? Uh, 8.2, that the Section 72 report from the Special Closed Meeting held June 7th be received. Does anybody have any objection to that? Seeing none. Announcements and reminders. A special Board Meeting, tentative August 30th, 2017 at 6 p.m. Education uh, Committee Meeting, September 6th, 6 p.m. Business Committee Meeting, September 13th, 2017 at 6 p.m. Regular board meeting September 27, 2017 at 6 p.m. Uh, pursuant to 2.3 Code of Conduct 2.3.2P 4.2, enforcement of the Trustee Code of Conduct, Trustee Jamie Brennan has been issued a written letter of censure marked personal and confidential dated June 13, 2017. Presentations, Mr. Allen. Welcome. Former trustee, Nelson Allen, please. Thank you. Put this little gizmo to work. Well, first of all, I want to say thank you very much for uh, getting me on the agenda. I know you've been busy and I've been postponed before, but the topic is, uh, I think, an important one to you. And I'm going to make some suggestions. But first of all, uh, I'd like to tell you where the where it came from. Uh, uh, we have, well, my years on the board, we have developed and you've enhanced the facilities plan more recently in April. And uh, so that's where we stand in terms of what we, what we want to do with uh, our facilities in the district being filed in Victoria. Now, when I've gone online with the ministry to get certain information, you could at one point get the uh, utilization rate uh, from the ministry's website for every school district of the province. And then more recently, it seemed to have disappeared. And uh, so you could say, well, for 70% uh, utilization, they're not going to get any money. Okay, for 95, anywhere to 110, you're in the ballpark. Now, I believe, and I think others do, that that was a pretty good policy on the part of the uh, government elected in 2000 to have that policy because it controlled the expenditures. 
So you'll see as we go along that some of the approvals were from the former NDP administration up until about 2003 or four because they were in the works. And then there was a gap where nothing was approved and then 07, 08 more, more capital works were approved around the province. So what I had requested, I, I phoned down the ministry, I went online, couldn't find it, phoned down, talked to people, couldn't find it. So I got a hold of uh, the MLA, Leonard Crow, and uh, on my behalf, he wrote to the minister who actually responded. With, and what I asked for, the total number of schools by district that have been newly constructed or had major renovations made to an existing school within the district, the total actual final cost of this project, an amount of monies that each district contributed as their share of the construction related costs of any and actual contributions of any other entity in cash or in kind for the project and copies of any land that was purchased, leased, actually within the 10 year period. And the actual utilization rate of classroom space in the district at the time the project was received. Now that all that information was very helpful for the ministry, except for the last the utilization rate, which I had wondered about, and you can't find it on the website. So in my research uh, with this information, I uh, managed to find some information you might find of interest. So I just press this, the way it goes. Bill? Yes. The, the center part, no? Which yeah, just right? on the right there. The right, right side? Yep. Oh, okay. So, I've, I've looked at the five-year capital plan and the facilities plan. So there, I talked about the utilization policy, and you probably knew that just prior to the last election. Uh, the policy was withdrawn. Must have been the election. And there's a myth out there that monies are only available for maintenance and repairs if you don't fit within that parameter. Now, uh, <coughs> the school districts, I, I extracted some information and um, the, I'll give you the, the, num the names of the district. Like for example, number eight is Kootenay Lake, number 19 is Revelstoke, number five is Southeast Kootenay, number um, 20 is Kootenay and, uh, and Kootenay Columbia Trail and so on. So if you look at this one uh, for um, the uh, dist District 5, 10.6 million, and the years are down there, 0102. That would have been a carryover from the NDP administration. And then 17.5 million, 0708. That was a new one, and 0708 was the next one. And then, Arthur um, <coughs> Day Elementary School, a friend of mine used to be the principal there years ago, 14.1 uh, million. And then Revel, Revelstoke uh, Secondary. Well, we have a business not up there quite often, we're going to be in next week and uh, talk to the superintendent and trustee and watch that new secondary and elementary school be rebuilt 2011-12. Now when you look at that, there's $141 million over 15 years. So I asked for figures for 15 years and received them. So that works out to about uh, those districts getting about $9.5 million a year in capital funding a year for 15 years. Now, in uh, Nanaimo, Cinnabar Elementary, 0102, Wellington, 0102, and Koltai, 0102. So that was a carryover from uh, the previous funding in the NDP administration, and maybe part of Lady Smith, 0304, I'm not sure. But the Wellington uh, seismic upgrade and so on, they didn't have the figures in for that, so that's not included here. So those are smaller numbers, and they come out to 13.2 million. So you could say we got an average of about $880,000 in capital funding over that 15-year uh, period, compared to the nine and a half million. So from 2006 to 2015, approximately 45 uh, school construction pro projects were undertaken with costs ranging anywhere from 10 to $60 million. And the total expenditure in that time was approximately $600 million. So there is money out there, and there has been money out there. Not all goes to Surrey. Surrey got a, a lot of money because they need a school about every week. 
So in the key roles, the role of our staff, we've got a great staff here, and up to date and in, in contact with the staff in Victoria Capital Planning Branch, and the role of the Board of Trustees in securing capital monies for school construction. And as you know, nobody gets any money unless it comes out <coughs> of the Treasury Board. And get, to get money out of the Treasury Board is basically a political decision. <coughs> and so the Board needs to get together and get the community uh, behind the Board in order to achieve some additional funding. So my proposal, which is not new, is that the district start the public consultation project on the NDS uh, replacement options, and have a wider community take have the wider community take part in the discussion. Now I did read that you were prepared, preparing to do that, and uh, we were talking about it a couple of years ago also. So hopefully that will get started. Now this is a comparison. J. Lloyd Crow and Secondary Trail was built in 1952 and replaced 55 years later with a new school at 30 39.4 million dollars. There's a current enrollment about 825. NDSS was built in the same year, 1952, 65 years ago, and it's old and as we know it needs to be replaced. Now, we need to, part of our plan is to work with VIU and the city and some of that's happening so that more recent transaction of property for um, the Rotary Bowl, this Roxham Stadium uh, with the city. There's a fundamental difference though. The city kind of likes to do things quietly in the background and the mandate for the school district is more you a larger constituency for public consultation so you have to be out, out more in the public. Lucky city. So, the I think we need some more clarification now, an update on the role of the city and VIU in the project, and that uh, the district land and how that's going to fit into the overall the overall um, plan they have in mind. So, if you look here. Apparently, okay, here we go. So there's parking lot, Stockton Stadium. Rotary Bowl, this triangle now is going also. And uh, that um, is the Knack Pool, which years ago happened because Jeff Little, a uh, counselor at the time, and they were talking about the referendum passed that they might not be able to build the, the uh, facility because they didn't, the land prices were going up. So I said, well, the school district has got land, let's talk about it. So we ended up having that put there. So here's NDSS, and this is the whole area here with the school district office and the uh, operational center of buses and so on. So there, is, uh, there are some options in there that will be looked at in terms of where the new school would go. It wouldn't be necessarily called NDSS. And in your administration oper uh, operations center, <laughs> I think uh, we need a firmer timeline for the relocation of the DAC and the operations center. In my view, uh, the lands on the old Victoria Road would have been probably a good site, maybe not, I, I assumed it was, for part of the operations center of the buses and so on. Now I noticed uh, that there is a proposal in the Fiber Capital Plan to uh, demolish this building. Oops. I know what happened. Did I go back or something? No, nope, I the wrong thing. <coughs> Mr. Allen, to your time is your 10 minutes are up, so please wrap up. Oh, yeah, this is uh, right at the end of the day. Okay, so that property needs to be taken into consideration in the, the larger scheme, and uh, that property is being used for public education purposes since the turn of the century, and uh, so that if you take the last part, is if you take a look at where the property is there, it includes this whole area, 
right down there. And years ago when I was on city council, this whole area was rezoned for government use. So if you look down here, you have the court building. Here you have the city hall, the annex to the city hall. And up here over off the map, you've got the police station, the fire station, the community services building. And so it's a, a good place to, to put a, a proposal for uh, developing that property in the longer term and commercial on the bottom, new school board in the top, and perhaps a place for First Nations uh, um, uh, education sites. So that's basically what I wanted to say, and uh, if there are any questions, I will try to answer them. Well, thank you very much for your presentation. I sincerely appreciate your passion. Uh, it has been a, I know it's something that's been very important to you for a long period of time, and we're happy to hear what you have to say. Does anybody have any questions? Uh, Trustee Solomon? Yeah, I did have one, and I, I also want to thank you very much for coming. And uh, I think some of the points that you were you were pointing out, are, are, I think this board is attempting to review as well. Um, so thanks for that, and and certainly I would love to see a new high school as well. But one of the things that it was always I always wondered was in the decision to um, to go against the uh, building of a new high school at the Woodland site in 2008. And I know you're you're a trustee on that board. Um, what, I always wondered what the fallback position was, uh, because obviously we're in a situation that reflects some of some of that uh, some of those decisions. The fallback position for well, it, uh, the decision was made to counter the option of, of building a new high school on the Woodland site rather than the ND site. Um, and obviously the ministry wasn't very thrilled with that and they got a new high school in Port Alberta, but, which didn't really help us out a lot. But I wondered, what was the fallback position in terms of moving forward to, to, with the vision that you have after that decision? Well, I think there are a number of things that over the years school districts have to put in modified plans. One of the big factors for Woodlands was that uh, it was the felt it wasn't anywhere near enough uh, open space for a uh, larger secondary school. It's pretty cramped in there. All three of my kids went there over the years. And, and as junior high, it was okay, a secondary. But they, the, the enrollment fell down, but virtually nothing. So here, with the transportation, uh, facilities and so on, and the other, other UTEP and the other facilities, um, the IU and, and the uh, pool and so on, is a better location, I think, at the school. One other thing I'd like to say, and that is with the, uh, we'll find out tomorrow, next couple of days, but we have a minority government, we all know, of one, one color or the other, but uh, in the absence of the, the uh, uh, 90% to 110% off the board, it seems to me this is a good time to make an application or to investigate uh, getting our oil in the water for some more money now. It might be an opportunity to do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Allen. Uh, 11.1, correspondence. That the Board of Education of School District 68 refer the correspondence read the use of Woodland Secondary Field from L. Servan to staff for a response. Does anybody have any objection to that? Uh, 11.2. That the Board of Education of School District 68 refer the correspondence read student teacher placements from S. Toll BIU to be received in file. Does anybody have any objection to that? <coughs> New business, 12.1. The uh, Board of Education of School District 68 approves the creation of a Parent Advisory Council for T CTC and BAST pursuant to the uh, British Columbia School Act, Chapter 412, Part 2, Division 2, Section 8.1. Do we need a mover and a seconder? I'll move that. Uh, can I have a mover? Moved by Trustee Broswick, second by Trustee Rutley. Uh, essentially, this is. Oh, yeah, just briefly. Sure. Um, I think this is a fantastic idea. The, I attended a, as did Trustee Solomon, we both attended a uh, uh, event at uh, at the over at Vast and NDSS 
uh, the year-end party, and there were a couple parents there who are, have already expressed an interest, and they're ready, and they're, they, they've been making connections with DPAC, so, so th I think this is very viable. Thank you. Anybody else like to speak to it? Yep. Uh, okay. Trustee Solomon? Just briefly, yeah. It's, it's a school within a school, but it's, it's it's its own independent school, and it needs reflection of that with, uh, with an independent PAC, and, and so, yeah, it makes a lot of sense for that. Anybody else? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. And I'm sure Trustee Higginson will jump in with, if and when you have something to say. <clears throat> yeah, you can count on that. <laughs> I knew I could. Uh, 2.2. .2. Uh, Trustee Rutley and I'll read this knowing and you can move. Uh, that the Board of Education of School District 68 funds service levels from district counseling at the same FTE service level for 2017-18 as the 2016-17 calendar year. Can I have a move in a second here? I'll move second. by Trustee Rutley, second by Trustee Brozovic. Trustee Rutley. Um, so at our, at our last NDTA uh, TTLC meeting, uh, Trustee Higginson and, and uh, Kimler and Brozovic and myself um, heard from uh, the NDTA that, that counseling, um, elementary school counselor service levels were reduced uh, due to you know, budget changes. And as you guys know, uh, our lift funding was, uh, was reduced. Um, and basically we've like I'm thinking as I want to look at cuts farthest from the classroom and things that affect kids the least as far as as um, reductions and budgetary changes um, and because we are going to see more more heads in the rooms there's going to be more more students and uh, as we all know more teachers um, that that counseling you know, when kids are in crisis and a counselor is now split between, instead of two schools, they're now split between three schools. So they're seeing a direct impact uh, for teachers that are, that are actually being able to see less um, people in the moment because they might be pulled between various schools. Um, they're, they're also doing a lot of the, the ministry like risk assessments and some of the real safety stuff for our kids, our vulnerable kids in the district to make sure they're safe. So these are just very important um, staff overall to the entire community, right? And, um, and, I, and I know, uh, like I've, he I've heard from, from uh, Mr. Blaine, where are we gonna fund, where are we gonna fund um, this money now that the lift has been lift has been re reduced i'm thinking uh like the supplies and services that we have in our budget i think it was five hundred and forty two thousand dollars um for the additional um monies that we've received from the ministry uh we've allocated that um we also have surplus you, you know fairly often we have surplus uh within the district um also, we, we're looking at 87, 87 new teachers, and we've allocated $8.7 million for those teachers. And we all know new teachers don't cost $100,000 each to the district. So there is some money within, within the budget, right? We've been fairly conservative in our, in our budget um, numbers. Um, and also, too, we're, you know, as you guys know, we're, now that we have a a larger group there's also going to be upper management positions um, that are that the district is looking at um, adding right so so we could just simply not add a position so there's all sorts of different places where we could find uh, that money and what it is we've heard from the NDTA that it's about five positions we've heard from um, superintendent Blaine that it's 1.8 so there's a bit of uh, FDs. So there's there's a bit of work that we need to do on really hammering this down. I was hope I was hoping we would discuss this at a business committee and have have a little bit more interaction. But I think it's really important just that we, um, because these are our, vul our vulnerable kids, and it comes back to safety issues within our district. And we're talking about half a million dollars. I think I think this is a really important thing to at least maintain especially as we're getting more classrooms, more teachers, 
student enrollment is increasing, I'd hate to see us reduce counseling services within our district, right? So that's my Thank you. two cents. Yeah. Anybody else like to speak to that? Trustee Solomon? Well, I'm going to vote against the motion, and I, I, I um, and that is not reflective of the work that the counselors do in in our school district. I think that the uh, counselors uh, do a tremendous amount of work and are a very, very important part of our district, as well as everyone else in our district. And um, we have a lot of needs. Um, we have uh, people. I would I would love to see more child and youth care workers. I would love to see more community support workers. I would love to see more TAs. Or uh, uh, um, I'd like to see uh, more people added to QP in terms of support people, in terms of carpentry and whatever. Each of these people support our district and our children in our district in, in their own way. I, um, this, this kind of, um, of uh, piecemeal uh, situation where there's an uh, individual, well, we want, you know, with this, this specific addition or this specific, I think that there's uh, ongoing uh, discussion uh, between uh, senior management and QP and MTTA. And I think that that's very, very important discussion. And they bring information back to the board, and we and we decide where the priorities should be in terms of what money is available to this district in terms of spending for our kids. And I am not keen about a piecemeal thing. Well, we'll add one one counselor or two counselors or three. I, that's not where. That's not the discussion I want to have right now. So I'm going to vote against it. Thank you, Trustee Robinson. <coughs> if I'd taken notes, I'd swear that. Trustee Solomon was reading my notes. I did. Up, <laughs> up until the end. Um, we can always use uh, more counselors, and I, I think we don't uh, acknowledge enough the importance played by child and youth care workers in, in our district. Um, but I would like to see us work to meet all the commitments in the 2002 agreement and then when we review the budget again in October, let's look to see if we can't uh, adjust <coughs> and add a counselor or two and maybe a child and youth care worker or two. Right now, I think meeting that 2002 commitment is the answer, so I vote against the motion or will vote. Against. Uh, thank you. Trustee Browser. Thank you. Absolutely, Trustee Robinson is correct that meeting the requirements of the 2002 agreement is absolutely paramount. That, however, is the responsibility of the provincial government to ensure that the funds are there for that. And it is not, it was made very clear in the ruling, which I've read, that these funds are not to uh, have a negative impact on the existing operating budgets of, of uh, school districts. Uh, what we're talking about here is not an, um, an addition, it's basically it's maintaining the status quo with that 1.8, which is why I support the motion. We're not asking to increase it beyond what it was last year. We're asking to maintain it. Thank you. Trustee Kimmel? Uh, yeah, sure. While I, while I understand that uh, <clears throat> the desire is to keep the level the same as it was last year, uh, it's my understanding that the lift fund went away with the Supreme Court decision and it's part of the negotiations that the BCTF have been involved with uh, the province in bringing back the language from 2002. Um, unfortunately, the reality is is that the province is only willing to fund for a certain level and it doesn't include the, 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 the level to which the, we had last year. Uh, and, and that's unfortunate. Um, I do believe, however, that the uh, kids of this district deserve better than a reactionary decision um, from, from this board. Um, I, I think that um, the, the numbers that we heard uh, from uh, the discussion that we had with the NDTA uh, during the TTLC have, have changed. And, and I think that the reason why is because um, this is an ongoing process. Uh, we, we, we have not um, come to terms yet with the Supreme Court decision. And I think we will see shift and changes from, from now through the summer and until the, until the fall. I think, that, uh, I think that it's inappropriate for trustees to inject themselves into this negotiation process at this time. I think that it would be more prudent for us to take a wait and see approach um, 
and and to look at the whole system because it's a very large system. It's it's more than than um, than just counselors. And and in fact, um, and, and going back, I was very tempted this year to make a motion to. Um, to allocate funds to provide for Aboriginal coordinators, because I learned um, through um, through the discussions that we had here at the board that the transition rates for our Aboriginal learners uh, are great, right up until grade 12, and then at grade 12 we lose nearly 40 percent of our Aboriginal students, um, which gives us grad rates that are. Uh, that are not anything to boast about. And, and to me, if, if we're gonna focus money on something that's, that's critical, I, th this is an area that we can make um, a real strong impact. So for me, it's not like, well, gee, I, yeah, I, I want counselors, but yeah, I want Aboriginal coordinators, and I want teacher librarians, and I want QP workers, I want janitors, I want the professional trades. I mean, a lot of these, uh, a lot of these groups have taken hits over the last number of years, and, and if we're going to make a decision about where to put money, and, 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 and there's a question of where this money comes from because we've allocated, these are reoccurring costs. We can't use our surplus to pay for it. We can't use contingencies to pay for it because they're recurring costs. You can pay for them for year one, but what are you gonna do for year two, three, four, and five? These are reoccurring costs. So we have to actually give up something if we're going to reinstate these positions as they're as they're currently um, set up now. So so for me, I, I guess I, I would rather let us see how the Supreme Court decision plays out, and then let us look at the hot spots. And I'm sure staff, as they, as they have done already, um, they'll they'll look at things and and they'll make recommendations about where we can get our biggest bang for our dollars because I think we have to look at the whole system rather than just a part of it. So for the, these reasons, I can't support this, this motion. Thank you. Steph, you have something you want to add to this? Uh, no, not at this point. I think it's all been said, but I won't be supporting this motion for many of the reasons already stated. All right, uh, I'll speak to it. Um, I, I can't support this motion. And the first thing I want to say is I don't think there's anybody sitting in this room that doesn't want more counselors. I don't think that's the question, like Trustee Solomon said earlier. And, and there's two parts to this. We've already passed a budget. The, the budget where these funds would come from, we went through a democratic pro process, the non-SCC budget, we passed that. Yeah. And w which would mean that we would have to reopen that budget. And if that's the will of the board, so be it. I, I know I wouldn't support that. We've already gone through that. And like many have said here, um, why, why counselors? Why not EAs? Why not people that cut the grass? Why not fix the lead in the water? Why not more Chromebooks? Why not more QP workers? And you know, we haven't even heard from our staff whether or not they think that that's what we, where we need to spend money. Because if we are going to spend this money, it's coming from somewhere else. It's not part of the SCC budget. That's a, that's a uh, a budget that is driven by formula. It has to come out of the budget that we already passed. And so for us to reopen that, that means we're taken away from somewhere else. And I know I voted, this board voted democratically to pass that budget. So for those reasons, I mean, there's still a lot of questions. Again, I don't think anybody disagrees. We'd love to have more of everything. But uh, at this particular time, I think it is far too premature to, to move ahead with anything like this. So. Anybody else? Trustee Bob? Um, I wonder if I could move a, a motion to refer this to staff for a recommendation. Well, uh, you could if you have something. Does somebody want to make a, it, an amendment to the motion? Or you want to do a separate motion completely? Because we're in the middle of this motion, so the only way thing that you could do is make an amendment to the motion. Mm. Otherwise, we need to see this motion. Well, I, uh -oh, probably. Uh -oh, uh -oh. So yeah, I would like to move an amendment. Amendment that says that the Board of Education of School District 68 refer the matter of district counseling to staff for a recommendation. 
Uh, second by trustee. Oh, no, I, I want to actually ask if I can make a friendly amendment to that. Well, first let's find out if it's accepted. Yeah, okay. So no. can we, somebody, somebody make us a, a seconder to the amendment? Can I have a seconder to the amendment? Okay, I'll second it. All right, so you want to talk to her about a friendly amendment to your amendment? I would just amendment? suggest that that would also include a the staff report on the, the make, make it clear that the staff report on the costs of what the, what what the 1.8 would, would be. Yeah. I think that would be all. Okay, as long as, as long as we're clear that we want that information too. Cool. Yeah. All right. Uh, do you want to speak to it? No, I think uh, it does more more discussion, and I would like to hear from staff. So, and I, I understand the um, the the notions of you know taking one issue and um, not taking everything into account, but I, I do do want to explore and fuller have a full understanding of the issue. Uh, for me, I'll, I'll go ahead. Can you get a Yeah. Just a point of clarification. Uh, should there be a timeline mm -hmm. on that? Yes. I mean, because we have a budget. Report back in the fall. Yes. <coughs> by, 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 by the fall. By September. So just another clarification. So this has nothing to do with the budget that's about to be discussed. No. Nope. So just so we're clear here, Trustee Routley, you can chime yeah. in here. What what Trustee Routley is asking for is something to be added right now. So what your amendment is asking is for a report to come in the fall. I think, and I'm just making a suggestion here, perhaps a, a better way to approach this, and it's up to you, that if you, after we decide this, you can decide if you want to have a, another motion to talk about a report back in the fall, because what you're asking for does not align with what Trustee Rodley is asking. That's okay. It still will be, there will be an opportunity to talk about it further, and I'm okay with that. I'm okay with waiting. Okay. So um, the amendment to the motion is then that we would wait until to the fall of next year to discuss um, help me out here to discuss the uh, get a staff recommendation on whether or not that we add this to the. Can I just have a point of order here? Yeah. I think that this um, this amendment is substantially changing the motion. I think yeah. it's a separate motion. Yeah. I think we should yeah, move motion. forward and vote on the current motion and then if that motion fails we can move this one this substantially changes yeah. the motion it's okay. not okay. along the same lines as the motion so i think that it you know as a point of order that this is a different motion it's not an amendment to the motion from what i'm hearing from where i am and i think that we should remove it from the table and vote on it separately i i agree that uh so do you have any objection from us no. from, okay so we're removing that amendment from the table we're back to the original motion that <laughs> has put forward. Anybody else like to speak to the, the motion? All in favor? Trustee, oh, sorry. Uh, all opposed? Trustee, Higginson. Trustee Higginson, Trustee Solomon, Trustee Robinson, Trustee Bob, Trustee Ray, Trustee Kimler, the motion is defeated. Thank you. Now do you want to make your motion? Uh, yes. I would like to move that the Board of Education, School District 68, refer the matter of school district counseling for discussion September 2017. We have a seconder, Trust, second by Trustee Brosnick. You want to speak to it at all? Um, I've already said it. Basically, would just like to, to know a little bit more. It does warrant a little bit more discussion. and. Trustee Kimler? Uh, yeah, I'd like to make a friendly amendment to that if I can. So um, I don't think September is an appropriate time to really look at this. And, and the only reason I say that is because we're going through this whole Supreme Court thing. So I think it's going to take through the fall until we really understand like where we stand for counselors, where we stand for teacher librarians, where we stand for teachers and EAs and all that thing. And so I, I guess my friendly amendment would be to um, to push that back until the next budget. Um, and then we can have a fulsome discussion about all of these hot spots, about where we can, I mean, hopefully we'll have um, some, some funds at the end of the year. 
and, and then we can apply to some of these areas that, that are um, uh, problematic. And, and I don't disagree at all with, with uh, uh, Trustee Rowley that, you know, we, we need more counselors, but we need a lot of more things, right? So that, that would be, okay. that would be. Are you okay with that. the friendly? I am. Amendment? So just for uh, Ms. Blaine, some clarity. So that would be to the amended budget. Yes. Where then we uh, exactly. would normally go and look into the amended budget and can reallocate in those types of things on recommendations from us. Yeah. So that yes. would be the time of that. Yes. So this motion isn't necessary. It's going to come up as part of the amended budget in mm -hmm. October. It is, but we've made it a motion now. So that, that is the will of Trustee Bob. Yeah, I just want to say that we have a number of priorities in this. By making this motion, it does you know, elevate it as a, as a priority, too. And it, I don't think it will have a huge impact. Any, any other discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Well, oh, uh, Trustee Higginson opposed. Thank you. All right. Moving on. From the Education Committee. Uh, Trustee Higginson, would you like to read this or would you like somebody? I think it makes more sense for you to read it. It probably will come across as a jumbled mess on the live stream if I try to read it. So. Okay. Uh, that the Board of Education at School District 68. Uh, and I'm a lady Smith that the Education Committee in its entirety work together with the District Aboriginal Educational Team to collectively develop a board definition for reconciliation in education for the Nanaimo Lady Smith Public Schools starting in the fall. This process will be culturally, culturally relevant, sensitive and significant and may require the committee to have closed meetings that will be witnessed and reported out at a regular public meetings of the Education Committee. Can I have a move and move a second? Moved by Trustee Higginson. Sure. Uh, seconded by Trustee uh, Ball. Uh, would you like to speak to it, Trustee Higginson? I uh, know. I think we spoke to it in depth at the um, Education Committee meeting. So unless people have other questions or concerns, then I'd just like us to move forward with voting on it. Any other questions, concerns, comments? <laughs> Seeing none, all in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimously. Thank you. From the Business Committee, Trustee Kimmel. Uh 13.2.1, uh, regarding the 2017-18 annual budget bylaw. So just as a point of information, pursuant to the School Act, Section 68, uh, parentheses 4, a board may not give a bylaw more than two readings at any one meeting unless the members of the board who are present at the meeting unanimously give the bylaw all three readings at that meeting. So the recommendation is that the Board of Education of School District 68 and I'm Old Lady Smith give the School District 68 and I'm Old Lady Smith 2017-18 annual budget bylaw all three readings at this one meeting, June 21st, 2017. I have a move and a second. Moved by Trustee Sullivan, second by Trustee Robinson. All in favor? Opposed? So Trustee Routley, you realize if you oppose this, that means we have to come back again, right? So what we're well, asking, after this meeting, you yeah, we have to come back. We have to come back for another meeting. Another meeting. So all this is all this is. You're this not is agreeing to the budget. This is to have all three readings in one. You can still vote. So you can still budget. vote against the budget at the readings, but okay yeah. okay well I'll, 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 I'll vote for it then thank you I mean, I'm not, so was anybody opposed? opposed nobody's opposed okay. nobody's okay. opposed yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. thank you for that yeah. I don't want to. No. <laughs> so the, the first reading a bylaw of the board of education of school district number 68 and i'm a lady smith called the board to adopt the annual budget of the board for fiscal year 2017-18 pursuant to the section 113 of the School Act, RSBC 1996, C412, as amended from time to time, called the Act. Number one, the Board has complied with the provisions of the Act respecting the annual budget adopted by this bylaw. How do I get all this? Number two, the bylaw may be cited at school district number 68, and I'm a lady Smith, 
annual budget bylaw for fiscal year 2017-18. Number three, the attached statement two, showing the estimated revenue and expense for the 2017-18 fiscal year and the total budget bylaw amount of one million forty nine one hundred forty nine million three hundred thirty eight thousand six hundred fifty three dollars for the 2017-18 fiscal year was prepared in accordance with the act and number four statement two statement four and schedules two and four are adopted as the annual budget of the board for fiscal year 2017-18 can i have a mover and a seconder please moved by trustee bob second by trustee solomon all in favor opposed Opposed by Trustee Brosvick, yes. Trustee Routley, Carrie, thank you. Uh, second reading, a bylaw of the Board of Education of School District Number 68, and I'm a lady Smith called the board to adopt the annual budget of the board for fiscal year 2017-18, pursuant to section 113 of the School Act or SBC 1996-C412 as amended from time to time called the Act. Number one, the board has complied with the provisions of the act respecting to the annual budget adopted by this bylaw. Number two, that bylaw may be cited as the school district number 68 in the Emily Smith annual budget bylaw for fiscal year 2017-18. Number three, the attached statement two, showing the estimated revenue and expense for the 2017-18 fiscal year and the total budget bylaw amount of $149,338,653 for the 2017-2018 fiscal year was prepared in accordance with the act. And number four, statement two. Statement four and schedules two, two, four are adopted as the annual budget of the board for the fiscal year 2017-18. Can I have a move and a second, please? Moved by Trustee Robinson, second by Trustee Solomon. All in favor? Opposed? Trustee Rowley, Trustee Brozovic, carried. Clarification before we move to third reading, please. Through the chair. This is third reading a reading that has to be unanimous? Yes. No, okay. I couldn't remember. Yeah. It was only the no, it's only that the first only one part that, that has to be yeah. yeah. What's the first one? Okay, thank you. Uh, and so for the third time, not to repeat myself. A bylaw of the Board of Education of School District Number 68 and I'm a lady Smith called the board to adopt the annual budget of the board for fiscal year. 2017-18 pursuant to section 113 of the school act rsbc 1996c 412 as amended from time to time called the act number one the board has complied with the provisions of the act respecting to the annual budget adopted by this bylaw and number two this bylaw may be cited as the school district number 68 and i'm a lady smith annual budget bylaw for fiscal year 2017-18 number three the attached statement <coughs> showing the estimated revenue and expense for 2017-18 fiscal year and the total budget bylaw amount of $149,338,653 for the 2017-18 fiscal year was prepared in accordance with the act. And number four, statement two, statement four, and schedules two to four are adopted as the annual budget of the board for the fiscal year 2017 and 18. Can I have a move and a seconder, please? Moved by Trustee Solomon, second by Trustee Robinson. The, I can feel the excitement in here. It's possible. Uh, all in favor? Opposed? Trustee Routley and Trustee Brozovic. Carried. Thank you. Thank you for reading that. Yeah, thanks, Scott. Okay, we're going to through that. Uh, senior staff reports. Now, uh, before I get started here, I, I just wanted to say that. Uh, um, we're not going to be asking any questions tonight, just like in front of the business committee. These guys are going to make their presentation and uh, we can save our questions. So it's just uh, one after another. Although I have other questions, I'll come by your schools now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. Just before I introduce uh, Ms. Gray to introduce the presenters, I'd just like to say this is part two of uh, the presentations that I observed two weeks ago. Uh, and I hope you enjoy it as much as I did when I watched it. So, uh, it's great. All right. Well, we're delighted to have our four school leaders, or and the vice principals here this evening to showcase their schools and their learning. So we have uh, four people I'd like to introduce. Uh, Teresa Craker from the Bay Secondary School will go first. Uh, second on the docket would be uh, Ms. Margaret Olson uh, with Vice Principal Lillian. 
De, Oliveira, De Oliveira. Uh Thirdly would be Jeff Hausenauer from John Barsby, Vice Principal. Uh, Ms. Marshall was not able to make it this evening. And lastly but not least would be Mr. Chad Lintot. And I want to remind everyone you only have 10 minutes, and particularly Mr. Lintot. <laughs> <laughs> Takes me seven minutes to say hello. <laughs> so we're so pleased to have them. Um, we know the great work that they're doing out there, and every single one of them will showcase it so well. And we're very proud. And I know Mr. Sewell and I are very proud. And this time, I wanted to be able to introduce all of them. So welcome and uh, carry forward. Come on. <laughs> Thank you, Miss Gray. Hello everybody, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Teresa Craker and I'm currently the acting principal at Dover Bay. Uh, last year, mid-spring, we sat down together as a staff and we asked the question of each other, what do we want for our students? And what we decided above all else that reached all disciplines in all areas of the school was that we wanted our students to be more engaged and we wanted them to take ownership over their own learning. So that became our inquiry question, uh, our focus for this year. And at the grade eight level, this looked like a group of like-minded teachers uh, creating a structure that was built around uh, inter interdisciplinary uh, focus with collaborative prep built in for all teachers and uh, built around inquiry. So they, the students did all of their explorations and learnings with an inquiry lens. This particular uh, assignment was uh, an Aboriginal focus. It had an overarching question of how does where one live affect how one lives? And this question was asked in all of the discipline areas. This question was asked in French, in healthy living, in uh, math, science, English, and socials. So wherever the students went, whichever classroom they were in, whichever teacher they were with, the question was the same. In grade nine, it looked a little different, less built-in structure, but students were uh, still were within year-long courses, and they just had their presentations of learning last night. They were asked to choose three different uh, three different things that they were proud of over the course of the year, and bring them together into one uh, presentation. This young lady up at the top with the the wooden box, she chose to. Um, highlight the uh, hope chest that she built for her sister uh, in her woodwork class, in her elective class, and then she also included a, uh, a presentation that she had done on uh, Canadian provinces. She chose Alberta, and the reason why she chose Alberta and chose to showcase the box together was the, uh, that she wants to be a carpenter, and she wanted to explore the Alberta economy so she would know if there would be a job there for her when her time came. And uh, one thing that all grade eights had to do, all grade eights and grade nine, sorry, had to do at the end was they had to answer these three questions. They had to answer, what worked for you as a learner? What are you learning and why is it important? This is really important when it comes to student engagement. And what are your next steps? And I've got a, um, a little video here of some grade eight uh, students answering that question. Uh. This is an interdisciplinary project focused on Aboriginal understandings and that has one inquiry question as a focus for all subject areas. Um, I feel like it's important to learn about this because we are Aboriginal ground and we get to know our history and where we are. And it's very, my maps in general are very good for visual learners. So I feel like it'd be helpful to know how to connect things and instead of trying to figure it out your brain, you can just put it on a piece of paper and understand it's better. Something that worked for me was being able to plot everything out and sort of just look back and forth and start to see connections between one subject area and another. And I 
just being able to write the short essay <coughs> and carry it on the next one. Um, what I love about this project was having one main idea for every subject. So wherever we went from French to Philippi to humanities to STEM, we all knew what we were doing and how we just sort of Throw our ideas down, sort of just connected them into one big idea. Um, I feel like I'm starting to learn more about the original culture and um, how it relates to the way we live now and how it affected us back then. And um, I mean, I'm original, I don't know much about it, but through this inquiry project, I've learned more than I know before. I just want to change the order of the slides a little bit. Uh, this also meant uh, adding engagement in for our students. This also meant adding in different electives. And we added in a robotics class this year. And robotics is a, an expensive course to get off the ground. So we have to thank Val Martino uh, for being a coordinator for district resources for that, because we were able to borrow uh, different kits and different uh, resources, which made it a lot easier to really showcase this and get it off the ground. The two pictures at the top are the spheros, and what they uh, allow students to do is practice coding. So uh, the the little balls when you when you uh, use the app either on your phone or on your iPad, you are telling it in which direction to go. Uh, you're telling it to change colors. You're doing all sorts of different things, uh, and you can see the track. There's a start and there's a finish, and so these 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 little kiddos can get it turning left and right and up. Uh, racing along and it's interesting the teachers have just as much fun with them as uh, the students <coughs> uh, down below here where you see the benches uh, 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 around the students this was a friendly competition with Wellington and the students had to build robots that went and captured those balls and then took them and deposit the, deposited them in a basket and uh, it was a friendly competition so it didn't matter who won uh, but next year we are, this really captured the interest of our students and uh, we have added in an additional section of this so uh, more and more students are becoming interested in this. And a very healthy uh, population or demographic of, of females, so that's wonderful. Um, there is a group of students, we're talking about engagement, and there's a group of students that uh, we haven't been able to engage. We can't get them into the classroom. We can't get. We don't have the chance to offer them all of these interesting, um, interesting programs, or, or even even our pedagogy isn't reaching them because they are. Uh, they're the ones that aren't engaging in school because they have that internal anxiety. We can't get them in through the front door, and so we had. We were lucky enough to be able to offer a half-time outreach program. It's what this allowed us to do was to take away the large vastness of the school, to take away all of the all of the students, all of the numbers, all of the people in the building, to take away the transitioning from one classroom to another, the bells. It, it all we all got we got to take it all away and just have some students working in a classroom in a small space with one teacher where they didn't have to move around, uh, navigate with within the hallways, deal with the lockers and locks. They got to sit down and focus on finding a safe place, a place where they're comfortable, a place where they can make connections and relationships, and yes, do some uh, coursework as well. And we were very successful with this program. Uh, those students really found a home, and uh, we were again lucky enough to be able to increase the size of the program for next year. So it was a half time this year, and we have it as a full time program for next year. And there's even some students that don't make it to the door or to the uh, building for this kind of a program. And this teacher actually goes out and uh, connects with students either in their home or at Tim Hortons or in the library on a weekly basis just to, uh, to keep that connection going and um, to check in on coursework and offer support that way. Uh, oh, don't go there yet. Sorry. Um, <laughs> the dangers of changing it up on the fly. Uh, 
students, when we, when we shared our inquiry question with the students in the building, there were a number of students who wanted to be a part of that and felt that there were um, the students in the building weren't necessarily connected with what was going on and they really wanted to work to make that, uh, that, that was their role to help with us with that. And so Ben and Nevaden, who are two fantastic grade 12 student ambassadors, uh, did a lot of things, but they really worked hard on creating a student website. Uh, this is dbdolphins.com, and it is attached to our school website, but it is with a student focus. And it's the point of it is to just make sure that students always know what's going on. Uh, they worked really hard all year long, uh, and to their credit, they never let this get pushed to the wayside. They all, you know, it's completely up to date. There is uh, all sorts of things, all <coughs> sorts of uh, interesting things on here. You can read about Mr. Hancock, one of our vice principals, if you wanted to read a bio on him. Um, all of the, all of the uh, daily uh, announcements end up on here, the cafeteria menus, the Friday rotations, uh, different ways for students to get involved in all of the different things that are going on in the school. And uh, they have very successfully kept this going, but also created a bit of a succession plan as they've been training other students to uh, keep going, keep this going once they're gone. And then another thing that they really wanted to focus on, their legacy, so to speak, um, as they're graduating students, is that they uh, wanted to change the logo. We have been the wave at Dover for a well, since we started, and they decided that we aren't a wave. What are we? We are the Dover Bay Dolphins. So we started a logo contest, and we are just wrapping that up right now. And I'd actually like to ask you to help us be a part of that. Um, we have narrowed it down from about 70 different, 70 different submissions down to three. Uh, the criteria was that it had to be a dolphin that it had to be, uh, had to have Aboriginal content. That was another criteria, but I don't remember what it is right now, sorry. Uh, it was a dolphin and that it had to have Aboriginal content. And so I'm going to show you the three submissions and I'm going to ask you to help us out with the voting. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. Yeah? I don't know if this is a good to help this one vote or not, <laughs> but, is, is this for the event uh, yeah. It's a hazard. <laughs> Is it for the is it for the bad sound? This is option number one. <laughs> this is option number two. And this is option number three. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Do we have to oh. do work here? No, we can start. <laughs> <laughs> hey guys, can we have some order in here, please? Uh, Robin did introduce us. Oh, you can Normally, we don't look at them. them. Yeah, because you're going to look at them and not pay attention we're, we're, to what we're saying. We're, right? we're cheating? <laughs> Turn them upside down. Uh, so we put up the infographic. Infographic, pardon me. Uh, we decided to go with this sort of format for our school review because we wanted something tangible that we could reflect on this year and then also use with our staff um, for next year. So when we review and set our goals. And uh, John, you're correct. We, uh, we are going to laminate them and use them for placement. So we want them to be front and center with the staff. So 
the goals that you see, yes, you turn over. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff and I are well behaved. <laughs> the goals you see we created in the fall with our school community, and we have four goals, two that we carried forward from previous years, which would be goal number two around literacy and numeracy. I should put on my glasses probably. And goal number three around Aboriginal understanding. New to us this year is our goal on innovative pedagogy and our goal on social responsibility. So we're going to highlight two of the four goals because, oh, the timer's not running, thank you. Um, <laughs> and that would be our social responsibility and our innovative pedagogy. And Liliana and I are going to do a bit of an Abbott and Costello piece, so she's going to start talking about social responsibility. So uh, one of the goals, social responsibility and student leadership, we're really trying to shift from a culture of teaching to a culture of learning. And I think that's not as easy as, as it sounds. And so we're bringing um, student ownership and student voice to front and center and making sure that students really are at the center of the culture and of the learning. Uh, we have two classes currently enrolled in uh, leadership and that was a very big uh, step for us this year. Um, they have been going out and making connections with the community, uh, with the La Rosa Seniors Home, with our feeder schools, and engaging in, um, in activities with them. If you take a look at the highlight section of the infographic, that first picture is our leadership students working with, um, uh, giving manicures actually to some of the seniors at the home. Uh, they recently gave a prom for the seniors as well, um, which you've probably seen in the latest in the Chronicle. So those are just some of the examples that they've just, they're showing initiative and they are coming up with their own projects to reach out and make those connections. Um, we also have different groups, uh, Pathways, Boys Group, we have the GRASP training. Uh, we are, kids are teaching dance to vulnerable students um, at the elementary school and it, it's really nice to see them taking that ownership. Moving on to the innovative pedagogy and flexible learning. There's been um, about three things that we've been working on. We too also have an outreach program that we're extremely proud of. Uh, this is our first year and we're fortunate to have Amanda Broadway be our coordinator in the program. And she's created such an exceptional program. Unfortunately, she won't be with us next year, but she is leaving us a, a legacy that we certainly are going to continue with. Um, it is a full day program. Um, and Amanda currently works with a similar clientele that um, Dover Base coordinator works with. Students that are disengaged, they're out in the community, they are coming to school. Some of them are working full time. We have one student that's graduating this year that moved from Alberta by himself, is working full time at um, Save On Foods. And so uh, Amanda was able to coordinate with him to get him through his courses. So we're so excited because we're graduating 13 students from our little tiny community that really wouldn't, wouldn't have uh, graduated at all. And if you look on your infographic, <coughs> your poster place, in our placemat, just above the uh, highlight <laughs> section, there's a quote from one of the outreach students and it's, it's really heartwarming. So give you a second to have a look at that. In this white speech bubble. In the white speech bubble? Is it? Under the highlights. Oh, did I say above the highlights? Oh, sorry. Yeah. There it is. Yeah. Above the next steps. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Next, next steps. steps. Oh, sorry. I don't have mine open. Mm -hmm. uh, our language and land-based learning program, I know that many of you had the opportunity to see the play that our students presented, and I know that many of you cried during that presentation. Uh, it is a halftime program, and we have two teachers that work in the program, Bill Taylor, who is the, te the lead teacher, and Mandy Jones, who teaches Hall Camino. There are approximately 25 to 30 students enrolled at any given time in the program, and it's an exceptional program. It's really our, our jewel that we're, we're very, very proud of. Um, the course, it's flexible <coughs> in the sense that students have courses that they're enrolled in, that everybody in the program is enrolled in, so everybody does outdoor ed, everybody's Hall Camino, but there's a piece of personalization where students get to pursue their interests. And the video that we're going to show you was created by one of our students who's interested in going on to film school. And he speaks to what the program, pardon me, the people in the video that he prepared speak to what the program means to them. As soon as Dale gets here, he finds it. Yeah. There we go. <laughs> This is so much more than a tree next to a highway. This used to be a 
more blur to the kind of meaning and to have much more meaning than just reducing oxygen. I kind of learned a lot of things in this class. Like, you know, spiritually, because uh, our elder in our class, Mandy Jones, she taught us uh, more about mental health, emotional health, and, you know, physically being healthy and how, you know, nature kind of help us feel a little more tight, swollen. Well, in my personal life, I feel like I became more respectful towards everybody. I've had to tell some people off because they were being too rude. And my mom told me, you, you changed, like, something happened to you. Like, you became more respectful, you became somewhere different. Something happened to you, and I'm like, because of the class. It's all because man gave it to Taylor. I gave a lot of thanks to them. This is about me to speak all quiet and go out. And I've learned that <clears throat> it's not always a bad thing be the person that you are. And that this class does teaches me a lot of things. I think it becomes much more communication and less rational thinking, which is probably good. It's too much Western society can be healthy. Yeah, I really love this class. I, I wish I could take it next year. Like, I would see it. Mostly, it wouldn't have much been a little bit different in a good way. Uh, today, at lunchtime, I was eating my lunch from the detectives, and I heard someone yell out, I detect Mr. Bronner right across the lunchroom and it was not anybody in our Latin face class, it was just someone else yelling out I need to the teacher at this class. Yeah, I used to hear the language like that in our school, so I thought that was wonderful. It's not spiritual in any way, or fairly liberal response. It's just, I never about the connection between how you speak and how you feel. But because the language is so, is a language that comes from the heart. When we speak in just little words, there's so much more meaning behind it than just saying thank you. Or hi, or whatever. And I used to think that spirituality is something for people that don't understand a sign. But actually, I feel like, how much can I know? And I realize that I don't know anything. And that's very freeing. I never say thank you anymore. <laughs> so when I, I'm out in the grocery store and I say, oh, hi, Chica, people are like, oh, what? <laughs> they give me that look wide-eyed, like, oh my god, what does that mean? I'm like, oh, I'm sorry, I was just speaking my language. So that particular weaving that you see was created by the class. Uh, it's from the original tree. Uh, it was cut into very, very thin slices. Um, it soaked in a pond and then brought back to the school and as those were those, some of the students in land and language based learning but other students participated as well and it's sitting in the foyer and the purpose of it is to protect the carving so it doesn't dry out too quickly. So that's just one of the activities and it, the land and language based program dovetails into our goal of Aboriginal understanding and it's if you have an opportunity to come out to oh, I'm not closing. I'm just going to close with this. Uh, if you have an opportunity to come out to our school and, and have a look around, it's absolutely beautiful. And we're very, very proud of it. But Lillian is going to speak to Fresh Street. Yeah, so this year uh, we decided to try a new electronic platform in, in order to make learning more visible um, and really increase the communication and efficacy of communication between the learning triads or parent, teacher, and student. Uh, and so the we focus mostly on the grade eights and nines, but um, Everyone is on a uh, fresh grade, and we really were trying to uh, allow students to take ownership of their, learn of their learning and show their parents, show their teachers, show each other what they're doing and what they're learning. And so it's really been um, very positive. Our parents are providing 
providing us with really positive feedback. Uh, there is a lot of engagement going on on the platform between um, the student, the parent, and the teacher. Uh, it's been it's been really very uh, rewarding to see that. Uh, we are um, making this shift now. Students are uploading their own projects. They're being proud to show it. I think there's a lot more um, onus now on it, and they're they're proud. You can see them taking more pride in their work and in their learning um, because they're going, oh, is this going to be shown? And we're starting to get away from is this for marks and more into the I want to show my work and my learning. So that's been one really positive um, highlight in our innovative pedagogy this this year. We could talk much longer, <laughs> but I know we're not supposed to. So please come visit us. Thank you. Shall I just dive in here? And Hi, everybody. I'll be right there. OK. Sure. Okay. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for an opportunity to speak about Barsby. I'm here on behalf of Principal Deb Marshall, who uh, yesterday had dental surgery. Uh, so I am presenting what she would have presented. Uh, it's uh, a lot of Deb in here and a little bit of me. Um, of the four goals that we currently have at Barsby, we decided to talk about social responsibility. Uh, at Barsby, we tend to see this as the glue that holds everything together. Um, and the term social responsibility tends to be quite abstract. By the way, I'm aware of the 10 minute limit. I intend to end two minutes early. I'd like to donate two minutes to Chad. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I will go. He's I, gonna need it. I'm gonna, I'm gonna skim the highlights pretty quickly. So, yeah. <laughs> um, abstract terms like social responsibility, and this is my little editorial here, are hard to work with sometimes unless you can rephrase it and own it for yourself. So my paraphrase would be, the following uh, social responsibility. How does each person, in this case at Barsby, uh, or indeed in our society, <clears throat> um, how do we want to live well with other people? That, that's what makes sense to me. Uh, not to live in a negative way, but how do we want to live well? And uh, the second word, uh, responsibility, I guess I rephrase as, what am I prepared to do to make that happen? So what I'd like to show you is a little story or, or some images of Barsby. Uh, uh, how do we do that? This is our motto. Try your best, do the right thing, get better each day. It's the Barsby way. We read that on our daily announcements. It appears in print. Um, it is, you'll hear it in the hallways. We, uh, we, we do refer to it a lot. And, it, and when we talk to kids, perhaps, for example, on a discipline, uh, disciplinary level sometimes, we refer to this because it's part of the culture of our school. Are you doing your best? Are you doing the right thing? Do you know what the right thing is? Um, this is the Barsby way. This is how we do it. We thought it was helpful to tie our efforts to the new uh, curriculum. And as you most likely know, and perhaps it's been a while since you checked the ministry website, but uh, the core competencies here demonstrated in this slide cut across all new BC curriculum. And it's the, the strand on the right-hand side, personal and social, that we want to dwell on. I'm not going to read it to you, uh, but we just wanted to highlight that uh, we are thinking broadly about what we're doing at Barsby and how does that relate to current trends in curriculum. Um, a little bit of technical information on the, on the ministry website. You will see the terms positive and personal cultural identity, personal awareness and responsibility, social responsibility. Um, and at Barsby we try to carry these out. Um, and here's the stunning uh, visual effect of, yes, there they are. Um, students who demonstrate social responsibility can be described as the following. A uh, couple of examples of, I guess, what I could call sub subcultures at Barsby, um, trying to live responsibly. We have our, our chef's training program. Um, there are many people packed into that kitchen all the time. And these are very diverse people. And throughout the day, they're, they're all working hard together. You may know we have a bike program at Barsby. We have an outside group that comes in. Um, and brings in scraps of abandoned bicycles that they find. And then through um, a, a series of weeks, a student can enter that program and come out with a newly built bicycle. So we're taking garbage out of the garbage stream, we're promoting healthy uh, transportation, and we're getting kids engaged in doing something productive. 
Let me just catch up with my notes here. Contributing to, big part, our talent show. And I think, I think you heard about our selfie group at a, at a recent meeting. Um, the selfie group is very important to us. It, it's a program that works with at-risk Aboriginal youth. It shows exemplary work on respect for everyone, the valuing of diversity, and, um, and asserting their rights. Um, some of you may have been at Barsby during the Northern Games, which we hosted. Uh, four high schools came together to display a great deal of collaboration, a value of diversity, and healthy competition. We didn't win, but it uh, was a good event. <laughs> okay. Um, you may know about our Yes to No program, which is a grade 7 and grade, grade 8 conference, if you will, organized by the RCMP. Uh, we had all our feeder schools at Barsby and our own grade 8 class in a, a, a conference-style conference event where they uh, circulated through different um, uh, seminars, if you will. And they learned about citizenship, social belonging, brain development, uh, drug awareness, exploring wellness, parkour, uh, and uh, trying to establish their own future direction. Uh, we're a community school, and under uh, the leadership of our community school coordinator, Basha Hanna, uh, there was a garden project. We now have community gardens just outside uh, Barsby. Uh, it was a great event. Classes came out and worked on the garden. We had community members working there. Um, and it was a good group effort to get our, our vegetable garden growing. When I was out there today, um, our kale and lettuce and other vegetables are doing very well. Um, I think, yes, this is the slide. Right up at the top right, you will see trustee Bill Robinson. I think that's you, Bill. Uh, this is oh, our good-looking, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Got a special sweater. On. That's the good-looking yellow sweater you're wearing there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, this is our living library event in which uh, Bill is instrumental uh, in working with us and bringing in professionals uh, representing different occupations into the school. So kids, again, in a kind of a conference style can go around and talk to, sort of in a speed dating fashion, I guess. They have five minutes to uh, hear about what different occupations are like, trying to set their own directions in life. Um, this is a charity uh, event. We got together and held a charity dinner to uh, support an orphanage uh, in Nepal, a uh, very important part of the culture of uh, Barsby, and demonstrates um, social responsibility and gets kids, kids engaged in that. Uh, the Hamper Project, our school uh, assembled 60 Christmas hampers this year um, to help uh, especially needy families in our community. Uh, defending human rights and advocating for others, learning how to speak up, asking questions, what are, <coughs> ethics? What are ethics in everyday life, and how do we use social media? Uh, this is a shot from our, our, um, our Yes to No conference. We welcome all uh, forms of life at Barsby. We welcome dogs and, uh, yes, even um, soldiers from ancient Sparta. Uh, they're all welcome here at Barsby. Uh, inclusive education provides opportunities to learn about, accept individual differences, lessening the impact of harassment and bullying. Uh, we may be, to my best information, the only school who, um, who celebrates a QP, a QP day. Um, the admin and teaching staff prepare uh, lunch for our QP members. Uh, we try to do their jobs as best we can while they're free to come to the lunchroom and enjoy a meal. If there is something free, it must be earned. This is preparation for real life. Students must pay back within the school community. Pictures of our students hosting a volunteer appreciation tea to thank our many volunteers. I'm sure probably everybody here has been to our feast. Um, it was the first time for me this year. I was just amazed by uh, the event. This takes place in the winter. It's run mostly by our um, Aboriginal Education Department. Uh, obviously, we have community members, and uh, there's Denise Fraser, our RCMP liaison constable, helping out. And just a few more shots of uh, the culture of Barsby. So when it comes to social responsibility, 
And again, these are my words, attempting to live well with others in your, in your own community. I think Barsby is making some great strides. So I actually, how am I doing for time? I think I might have shaved off a good five minutes for you, Chad. So uh, that's the end of my presentation. Thank you very much. Take as much time as you need. Why are they getting you hard time? You know, I don't mind being the butt of the joke. I really don't. Just makes what I'm about to say that much more powerful. I'd like to thank our board of trustees for your guidance and leadership. You really inspired. No. Um, actually, on a serious note. Uh, this is your last regular board meeting of yes. the years and that? Okay. It might actually be uh, a good time to, to honestly and sincerely thank you. And I mean that, uh, not because everybody <laughs> in this room professionally butters my bread. Um, <laughs> but um, it, was a, it was a crazy year. It was a, a lot of change and um, it was handled extremely well. Um, our board and our senior managers and our district staff um, did their jobs very well and they let leaders lead and they let teachers teach and they let learners learn and it was uh, it was a good year despite all that change so uh, before I start I want to thank you guys actually because you've spent a lot of time and a lot of effort thanking us for the work that we do but we're paid to be here you guys are quasi volunteers it would seem so uh, we thank you guys for the work that you've done certainly um, okay on that note I do want to share some success stories uh, with you from Wellington we had a number in fact when I listened to the other schools here um, it reminds me of the things that we did that I forgot that we did. Um, you jam so many things in a school year. You do so many amazing things. When you talk about the S and O, and we talk about um, the robotics, the coding, and, and all these things that we see, we go, yeah, we did that. And, and you forget about things over the 10 months because it is so busy, and it's, it's amazing the things that get done um, in, in, in rooms across the building and underneath your nose that uh, really teachers are just asking you to get that heck out of the way so they can do some fun stuff. So it was neat to see that's very inspiring. Um, I want to take it from a different perspective, if I may. I'm going to use the success stories at, at the school as a bit of a vehicle to talk about the people that made it happen. Um, we've, we've seen the great things that kids do, and I don't want that to be uh, uh, where I'm not going to focus, certainly, but I want to talk about the staff members that have allowed that to happen. It's been pretty remarkable what our staff has done this year, and I think maybe sometimes we forget all the change that they have, they have endured as well and what they're doing to get through that. So. Um, in order to maybe appreciate our success, I, I would ask that you imagine, uh, if you can possibly, a period of time in public education of uh, unlimited uh, uncertainty, if you will. Uh, a time where our staff, our teachers, our, our EAs, our parents, our PAC, our students have been asked to implement, develop and understand change in assessment, in curriculum and how we report that assessment. Um, and how we use our budgets, uh, looking at old contracts and, and, and restoring old contracts, um, looking in some cases curriculum that hasn't yet been written, and asking them to do it all and do it with a smile on their face and inspire kids. And they've done it unbelievably well. Um, so I'm going to show right at the top here, and I think I may have sent an old version of this to you, Liz, but I'll, I'll, I hope that it's on here. Um, our, oh, maybe I can try it here. Uh, perhaps this one will work. When you go to our site, and as you uh, go to anybody's uh, website at any school, we now list our school plan, our school goals. Um, we make sure the community can be a part of it. That they, our parents can see them, they're active documents. This is going to be what you'll soon refer to as an old version of a, of a school planning document. We are going to have a much more lively document, part of a framework for learning that we're going to be talking about. Um, that we will all be a part of. But I would encourage anybody, any one of you, to go to the school websites and look at these. They list the, the goals as developed by staff, as developed uh, uh, with, with parent involvement as well. And you will see on here that our goals included, I can't highlight it here, sorry. Um, develop our, and enhance our grade eight model inclusive of collaborative teaching and learning plans, new assessment strategies, new curriculum for grade eights, and it mentions down here establishing collective responsibility, communicative, or communication, and collaborative 
Norms. Um, wordy, but um, our goals for the year were focused on those, and I need to know how to get out of this now, sorry. Um, I, I show that just to encourage you uh, to read them and make sure that everybody's familiar with, with where those are. They, are. they are active documents, and we are held responsible to those once we put them on. Uh, it takes us back to here. So when we, when we talk about the people that uh, helped facilitate change, helped support change at Wellington, and, and, and I'm sure everywhere, uh, we have a number of, uh, of people, of course, who contributed. And I just want to quickly highlight some of the things that they had done to allow our students to be more successful. And then I'm going to go at the very end, show you some images of our grade eight year long learning model, which kind of is that vehicle for, for that change. So our, our PAC group this year um, had a simple goal, and that was in itself simplified. The PAC meetings were, were, were focused on budget allocations and how are we going to spend the money that we get. Our PAC changed their focus this year. And Trustee Bob, you came to a PAC meeting, and I thank you for that. And you would have noticed they're a very engaged, informed, and active PAC. Um, very quick to question the decisions of you. Um, <laughs> and, and very quick to ask me to seek answers as, as to why and how that uh, will impact the school. Because they have a right to ask that. Um, absolutely they do. And I appreciate that they ask that. So our PAC meetings were simplified. They were topical agendas. Um, they questioned, debated our code of conduct, our dress code, new curriculum, report card changes, um, the impact of changes as we restore old contract language. They wanted to know exactly what that's going to mean for their kids and their learning in the school. I love that parents ask that and they want to sit and talk about that. They put you on the spot a little bit that, that night, but every meeting was, was as, as you saw that night. Um, they hosted a number of events for us. They encouraged me to bring parents in to host parent information sessions on the curriculum, on assessment. Some of you came to those meetings as well. We held those in our uh, new presentation room. And the parents loved the fact that it was being hosted by PAC. They, they wanted to know what the curriculum looked like, what the assessment reporting orders were, and PAC was, uh, was kind enough to host those. Um, some of you may have attended the Screenators event that PAC hosted as well. Um, they got very involved, and they were very involved in our community and tied themselves into our, uh, our feeder schools as well. So I was very happy with their PAC. Our QP group, uh, in particular education assistants. Uh, our first staff meeting of the year, they asked if they could present uh, to our staff. We said yes, of course, um, not knowing what that presentation was going to be about. Our education assistants came in and said, um, Stop excluding us. Um, we want to be a part of how you're implementing new curriculum. We want to be a part of developing new curriculum. We want to be a part of how that is implemented in classrooms and how students are going to learn the new curriculum, particularly our at-risk students and our vulnerable students. It was, a, it was a, a risky presentation to make. It was a brave and courageous one to make. And, and they did it flawlessly. And the teachers stepped back and said, what would you like? How can we involve you? It was a, it was a bold move that was very, very well respected. Um, they now actively lead many of our PLC uh, groups, our, our professional learning communities, on, on, on working and uh, strategizing with our vulnerable learners. They don't, they don't sit and listen, they don't sit and take notes, they, they lead those presentations with our group, which is, which is fantastic. Again, very brave. Um, our office QP staff helped us pilot this year an online course selection process. So we were the first school to, to try that here. Um, it had its bumps, but our office staff had to learn that very quickly. They had to set the parameters on our computer systems, uh, get that infrastructure in place, but they did that. It was an additional task. They didn't have to do it. They did it gladly and willingly and ultimately successfully. And it allowed us to pursue another pilot for next year through their help, uh, one that we're working on with Robin right now, one of uh, many things that Robin is having us work on right now. <laughs> Um, important and necessary uh, and effective change, of course. Uh, but that will be opening up that MyEd portal as an effective means to, to use our marks. This MyEd um, system that we've all been waiting for, to open it up and, and, and use it to its full, fullest potential, we will be a school that will be able to pilot that. And, and much of that is due to the success and, and, and help of our QP staff in implementing our online course selection this past year. Our NDTA group, our teachers, of course, as we move around our circle here, um, if I may be so bold, I would suggest that our teachers were district leaders this year uh, in new assessment, in the development of new curriculum, and how we were reporting that assessment. Uh, I think we were very early adopters in many of that, uh, in many of those areas of change, and I think they were very successful in, in, in doing so. Um, 
to the to the point where our, our staff, many of our teachers are being asked to lead district initiatives and, and host a, a sessions for the district as well and to show the learning that they had done in those areas. And uh, they were proud of that. And so it's, it's something that teachers take great pride in when other staff and other schools are coming and looking for your support. Um, they adapted very quickly to the use of new assessment, new report cards, the Google Apps, our portfolio platforms, our new technology. Uh, through the use of PLC and additional collaboration time, there was a distinct shift uh, from the old way of holding on to what once worked, or holding on to what used to work, holding on to old ways of doing things because it was successful. And they made a, a, a very pronounced shift to, uh, let's try it because it's not going to cost us anything, it's not going to hurt it if we try, and it's better for kids and it's better for learning. And if it doesn't work the first time, we can try it again. And that's, a, again, a very bold move uh, from a group of teachers, and they did that very well, so I, I commend them for that. They developed a flexible year-long grade eight model, which we presented uh, this time last year to you. And uh, it, was, it was an idea that uh, about three or four of us had come up with. We put a group of 12 teachers in charge of it, and, and, and Scott and Nicole and I got out of their way again. And it's developed into something far beyond what we ever thought it would be. Um, enorm enormously successful, very unique um, to other grade eight uh, models, but uh, I think just as, as successful. Our district staff, you, as I said before, um, I think our district staff that's sitting with us here today did what they always do best. Um, they respond to the needs of the school. Um, it's not about dictating policy and procedure and, and ways of doing things to schools. It's about asking schools, what do your learners need and how can we support them? Um, the group that you have assembled has done that very, very well and it's very appreciated. Uh, it's, it's, it's difficult to, to hear, go do this, uh, when, when there's not an understanding of school context. There's clearly an understanding of school uh, context and what change is necessary, and they've adapted very well for us. Um, they put staff and leadership in appropriate areas. Uh, they've set reasonable and purposeful goals for us, and I think that's the important thing. We're, we're not being asked to do things for the sake of doing them, for the sake of change. The goals and, and, and they've set forward for us have been very purposeful. And um, I think now more than ever, and I hope you would agree, we are offering more opportunities for training for staff and focus training. Um, than I think we have before. So it's not okay anymore to say we need you to do this, we need you to learn it in a hurry. Now it's we will train you and we'll teach you to do this because we know that you need the help. So um, to all involved, um, uh, you need to know that's very much appreciated. Um, well, that's in case that other document didn't work. So how did we do? I actually had gone through that. That was uh, the last one. Um, our, our teachers, so when, I, when I use the example of of a student focus and, and letting go of what once was. Our teachers proposed a new uh, leadership model, a teacher leadership model to us and we thought, okay, and they went through staff <coughs> meeting, and they went through what was once department heads to our, our learning leaders and they, you can see one column there from 2015, 16 to 16, 17. These were, these were ideas that they had for us and how could they, could be, they, they could be more student focused and student centered. So moving from a science department head to that of student inquiry, from social studies to student advocacy, from math to numeracy, English to literacy and language, uh, a new one for ADST and electives, a new one for student assessment, who was the busiest learning leader uh, in the building by far this year. Uh, from infotech to technology and learning innovation, we were able to put together a, about a $5,000 teacher innovation fund this year, which was swallowed up by the end of September. Uh, for uh, new technology and new, uh, uh, new, uh, just great new ideas in the classroom. Most of that actually went to, to our uh, robotics program. From PE to physical literacy and leadership, athletics to student activities, and then student support remained the same because that's an overwhelming job. But this is their initiative. It's what teachers wanted to do to make sure that they were more student focused and adaptive. Um, I think we need to commend them on their willingness to change uh, during these times. So again, this is our vehicle I want to I show you. You're going to notice I'm going to roll through about 20 slides of our grade 8 year-long learning program. This is maybe a summary to the presentation we made at the beginning of the year, or sort of the end of last year. What you will notice when you look through here is there's very little use of classrooms. So this $24 million upgrade that we have been um, extremely lucky to receive at Wellington has afforded us the luxury of outdoor space, of collaborative space, of presentation space, classrooms that can be opened up in different ways. Uh, all of those ideas that uh, Pete's team had with uh, previous administration at, at Wellington, 
to say we can, you know, we can take some risks with the building. They are being used extremely well. And you'll see that here, rarely are kids in grade eight sitting in desks in the classroom, all right? So I'm just gonna roll through those. Uh, we started off with our Wildcat camp at Bevan. And you'll see as we go through here, most of the learning is done either outside or at the very least in groups. And these are all grade eights. Some of these pictures you'll see were from, were from the Cedar Project that we did this year that you would have heard in Woodlands last year. So I only recall who came with us this year to Wellington. We, uh, we engage in the same project. I sent a PowerPoint to, to Liz tonight that may or may not have done it. It was a pretty big file um, of a summary of that Cedar Project that um, we can send to you as well. So in conclusion, thank you very much. Uh, moving ahead, uh, what we want, would like to do next year, take those grade eights, take the successes of the grade eights, the flexible learning model, extend that to grade nine. They love it, the parents love it. They've been more successful, they've been more ready to learn, they've been more engaged. Continue with the new curriculum implement implementation and transition to our Maya reporting and open the communication portals in the fall. Those, those will be some of our goals uh, for, the, for the year ahead. Okay. So again, um, you, you've heard and, and seen, I thank you for those that have been in the building many times, uh, and, and I love that when you have been in there, you have seen those grade eights in, in, in those environments. They weren't staged uh, by, by any means. Um, but I thank you for, for being a part of that. And I just really wanted to focus on the work of staff this year. So I think it's important that you guys hear how much uh, work that your employees are doing in this district to make all this happen for kids. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I just wanted to say, and okay. I just wanted to say, you know, as the curriculum moves forward, as things change, it's so inspiring to see, you know, the group, what you guys brought forward tonight what you know your peers brought forward at our last meeting we are in such great hands and <laughs> we're in really good shape as we move forward it's very exciting to see the uh, what goes on and the leadership that we have in each and every school so on behalf of the board we want to all thank you sincerely for everything you do for our kids thank you and sorry for keeping you so late through all the other stuff but uh, if you guys want to Feel free. You don't feel like you have to stay, although you will be judged if you leave. Recall. Does call. Does anyone know what the name is? Oh, there you go, though. You all leave at the same time. Yeah, I know. It's got the flyers coming up. Thanks, guys. Give me money for it. Thank you. I like what happened. Crowd left. Feel judged already. Don't worry, it'll come Chad, on. Chad, Chad, Chad. <laughs> yeah, I got my uh, thanks. thanks, Pete, for all your work. Uh, moving along, uh, Director of Planning and Operations, Mr. Pete Sable. That's how you say it, right? Sable? Sable. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, tonight, um, Mr. Mike Ross, uh, our facilities planner, Planning Supervisor and I will present uh, a high-level overview of the five-year capital plan. And it's uh, getting a, bit, a little bit late tonight, so we won't dawdle around the, the district or the trustees have had the presentation, I think, since last Friday. We're prepared to answer questions as we go. There's a lot of terminology in here and different information. So if we skip along too fast, please just uh, 
So I just wanted to indicate, I'll start off the presentation and then Mike will take over near the end and then we'll get into a little bit more of the detail. And I wanted to thank Mike for all the work he's done on the capital plan last year and, and again this year. Thank you, Mike. Um, we'll just jump right into it. Uh, so there's some items of note. Um, uh, it, was, it was noticed and in fact there was an alignment at the Ministry of Education and it seemingly skipped a capital year. So what we submitted in as a 16-17 request uh, last year returned as a 17-18 approval. And uh, the Ministry advised as to why they were doing that. I have a slide from them we'll talk about. Um, in the plan, the programs continue to be prioritized on their own, meaning that we're going to have a list of seismic, we're going to have a list of uh, expansions, and they're going to be standalone lists that are submitted to the ministry. We didn't include the lists in the ministry's format tonight because they were very clumsy. So uh, what we're going to do is uh, we, we're presenting it in our own form, and then we're going to translate that information into the into the ministry's forms. Um, Mike and I kind of, to be honest, Mike and I lost a bit. We thought the board meeting would be on the 28th, so we're bringing a little less detail tonight, and we're got a little bit more detail to work to do before the 30th submission, but we're all set to do that. The ministry is still requesting now and almost exclusively a project request fact sheets versus business cases, and they've done that to uh, ensure that the districts are, or I think that the requests from the districts are comparable, so they're getting the same format from all districts. It's part of the ministry's uh, revision of the capital planning guidelines. Uh, we're only allowed to request certain projects in the first three years of the plan. Um, they still uh, look at uh, district contribution for funding of projects um, towards the SEP, and we're looking at uh, one, and Mike will talk more about that. And then the uh, school enhancement program uh, still remains. They've increased the funding. They're asking for a maximum of five separate projects. We can bundle them, Mike will speak to that. And the 1718 now can include flooring uh, projects and washrooms. So we're hoping to take advantage of that. Uh, this is a slide from the, um, uh, the ministry's um, a webinar on the capital plan guidelines. And so you can go through this on your own time, but it, it does indicate the process of the ministry evaluating all of the capital submissions. And so we're here at June 30th, and we expect a letter from the ministry, a capital uh, response letter in March to our submission. Um, as I said, uh, staff continue to work on a, a bunch of the detail, uh, updating the PRFS consultant reports, project costings, filling out the enrollment forms and a little bit more about the uh, budgeting work around the SEP program. The ministry, uh, there's a few changes to the capital plan instructions. They provide increased clarity on board resolutions, response letters, bylaws. We'll talk about the apprenticeship program, requirements for cost sharing of projects, information on construction signs, um, the SCC, um, they're now looking at modular options versus uh, stick build, and uh, that's something that we were considering as well. And um, um, that changes to the criteria for the SCP and bus, which are mine. So we've been meeting, having an ongoing uh, number of contacts with the ministry staff to make sure that we're in alignment with uh, the ministry's goals, um, four or five different. And, and one of the items that's uh, pretty big on the update is the SRG3, the Seismic Retrofit Guidelines version three. So. We'll talk about that in more detail. On public projects of over 15 million or greater, there's a requirement to use apprenticeships as part of the project. So we'll be considering that in future projects. Uh, also, there's a, a stated now contribution policy, and they're indicating that districts must contribute 50% cost share to all capital projects, save for seismic mitigation, where the lowest cost option is chosen by the district. And um, they're indicating that the 50% cost share is the starting point and the district's business case can uh, barter the, the ministry down and, um, depending on their rationale. So the ministry is just indicating that uh, districts need to be prepared to come to the table. Um, the capital response letter from last year, I want to just speak a little bit about that. So we received three projects last year, uh, one bundled project. And uh, we tendered that and awarded phase one, and we're requesting phase two in the 1819 uh, capital plan. Mike will speak more about that. 
The NDSS Woodshop Dust Extractor Project has been awarded and will be constructed this summer as well. And the BEP projects for Ladysmith, Dover, and Mountain View, we're awaiting BC Housing and Ministry to give us the, uh, the schedule as to how they plan to go ahead. Essentially, what we're understanding is that they're going to reassess the building envelope on those three projects as a beginning, as, uh, to begin. So it's not actually approval to construct at this point. Um, in your package is a copy of the approval letter from last year, just uh, out of information. So this forms the call from the ministry for the projects. And uh, so each one of these categories, Mike's got a, a slide indicating where we're, what we're recommending and how we've adjusted it. And the action sheet on page 58 with the recommendation indicates all the high level adjustments that we made from last year's plan. I'll just speak to the SRG3 and turn it over to Mike. So the ministry announced very quietly, but it has a huge impact to the district, or we expect that it will in the NIMO. As of July 1, 2017, the new seismic retrofit guidelines are going to come into effect. And this encompasses the new building code requirements. Vancouver Island is the most affected uh, area in the province of BC. And um, uh, we're now going to work with the ministry to identify and reassess all facilities for the impact for SRG3. And of course, we have three facilities that are in our seismic plan now. And because this doesn't take into effect until July 1 after the capital plan is submitted, we'll have a year to work and uh, design that way by the ministry, a year to start to reassess and put it in next year's capital plan. Um, staff expect the ratings to generally increase. Uh, seismic can be a significant driver for capital, including renovations, partial or complete replacement or consolidations. As we saw at Woodlands, a significant capital upgrade at Woodlands as part of the renovation. So we, we demolished part of the building and rebuilt it. And so Wellington. Those, oh, okay. Wellington? That's cool. Woodlands, yeah. wow. Um, so staff are currently, we've already started meeting with engineers with respect to uh, it is later than I thought. <laughs> uh, working with engineers for next year's one. Uh, and now's a good time to turn it over to Mike. Just before you yeah. do that, though, uh, just because it is getting late and I can't always remember what these things mean, it's that fourth or fifth bullet that says staff expect ratings to generally increase. Remind me, does increase mean that they're better or worse? Like, what, in, what does it mean when you say the ratings are going to generally yeah. increase? Yeah, the, the, the building code. Um, indicates greater seismic forces on buildings. I'm going to do this in layman's terms. Yeah, please. Um, and therefore, the, the buildings themselves have the same resistance, yeah. but subject to greater forces. Okay. Uh, in the build design forces. And so that means that they're not going to rate as well. Okay. So for instance, and, um, the hierarchy is um, low, moderate, high three, high two, and high one. And so a moderate might go to a high three, a high three might go to a high two, gotcha. and a high two might go to a high one. The ministry is currently indicating that they're trying to address high ones and twos. And so some of our buildings might shift into the high one and two range, which means that uh, there's more significant driver for the ministry to address those concerns. And a significant amount of the ministry's capital envelope is for seismic coverage. So I'm jumping ahead a little bit. So the next slide, shows three elementary schools in our district that are rated as H2. So they're expected to increase? Essentially, yes. Now, now there's a little bit of an uh, interesting twist to that because uh, at least one of them, Cedar Elementary, we received the assessment report after the building code release was announced. And so our engineer has actually considered the SRG3 guidelines in the rating for front, out of due diligence. So while an older rated school like ha uh, Pleasant Valley might increase to an H1, uh, the later rated school like Cedar might not jump up. Uh, so these are the top three priority schools in our seismic mitigation program. This is a carryover from last year's plan. Um, we didn't receive any response this year. Um, Pleasant Valley, uh, still an H2. Um, these budget numbers are from 2015 to our SPIR, or SPDR, sorry, in this one. Um, we'll be looking for a response in our next capital response letter. Uh, Cedar, uh, another H2. Um, this is a 2016 estimate of $5.1 million. Uh, we'll find out if we can proceed to the SPDR, hopefully, in our response letter. And Solaire, um, 
$3 million budget, and we'll also be waiting to see if we can progress, you know, proceed to the SPDR. Uh, Rutherford uh, has been removed from the plan. Um, it was an H3. Uh, it was an H3 due to the SRG3 guideline. We use those criteria when having the school assessed, which helped form the business case for closing it. Um, the expansion program. So we have four um, projects in our expansion program. Uh, first one's the Hammond Bay Gym expansion, which was uh, our second priority last year. Frank May has come off, uh, so we just moved them up the list. Uh, second is the Hammond Bay Elementary Edition, uh, Forest Park Edition, and the Cinnabar. Um, so as I mentioned, Frank May has been removed from the list because we're actually up for tender on that right now, and that closes next week. Um, the Hammond Bay Elementary to a large the gym to a full-size gymnasium. Um, we completed the PDR in January of this year. Uh, it's going as our first priority project in the expansion program um, and with a budget of $1.5 million. Um, second project uh, in our expansion program, uh, Hammond Bay, we've updated some costing on this uh, based on some development we've done over the last year. Uh, coming out of our master planning process and developing some options for the school. Um, our budget has increased to 9.3 uh, based on a, what would be considered a class D um, estimate. Uh, Forest Park remains in the plan. Um, it's in year four right now. So we don't have to do much in the way from ministry um, requirements for detailing scope or costing. Uh, it's on our radar. Um, we're expecting enrollment to exceed uh, by 96 over five years. So we're we're looking. We're starting to look at that school, uh, and the same for for Cinnabar. We're projecting some growth there. It's out in year four or five. Um, it stays on the plan. Park Avenue was removed from last year's plan uh, due to changes in catchment and reduced enrollment. So yes. Right. Thanks, if I could jump in, Mike. I, I just wanted to point this out. Um, as, as I said, we've removed this from the plan. In 2016, we did a catchment change process that involved a number of schools in the south end and, and went as far as Fairview, Brecken, and Forest Park. The changes has seen uh, us forecasting a balancing of enrollments in the south end. So where we were looking at an addition at Park, now it's a little more balanced. There's a few more students to Bayview, a few more students to uh, Georgia Avenue, et cetera and the result is a removed from the plan, so we're quite pleased with that. Uh, next up, uh, replacement. Um, we've added Lady Smith Intermediate. Uh, that's a new one from last year. The Nama District Secondary, the DAC office, and the maintenance yard are all carryovers from last year's um, submission. Uh, Glory to Lady Smith. Uh, Lady Smith, uh, we're looking to replace Lady Smith. Um, we've done a, uh, we're looking to do a building condition assessment, a land use analysis, appraisal, uh, a master plan for relocating Ladysmith Intermediate to Ladysmith Secondary Primary Site. Um, and we'll be submitting a PFRS light uh, with our capital plan submission, just the initial stages of a business case. If I, if I could just speak to that as well as, as the board is aware, there's a committee that uh, it involves our staff and the city staff uh, working on this in, in consultation with them. And so when we talk about the possibility of going to the primary site and, and the secondary site with this, it, it's uh, with their understanding. And so it, it's not a surprise. So uh, just to let you know that. So. Yeah. And the reason for inserting it as the next priority is just to make the ministry aware of what our plans are. We've had discussions with them already on that. And, and, and again, it may not mean also this plan may not mean that we're, it's a total replacement to the building. We have some different options we're looking at that we are quite excited about. Uh, NDSS, again, um, this is out in year five as far out as we can push it, but still keeping it on the radar. DAC office, same thing. It's it's still on the radar, but it's hinging on what happens with NDSS, as does the maintenance yard. It's all part and parcel. Uh, building envelope program. Uh, we did receive a response last year from Mountain View Dover and Lady Smith, as Pete mentioned. Uh, we're just still waiting to hear from the ministry what the next steps are, and it's likely just a reassessment. Uh, 
the costing that was done back in 2006 is obviously dated as our codes and requirements. Um, uh, we've been told just to keep all the projects that we have on the BFP list, stay in the plan until we get some more direction. Uh, so we have currently have seven out there. This is for buildings that were por or portions of buildings constructed 2000 and later under those current those, those building codes. Um, Mountain View, um, like I mentioned, the, the budgets are 10 years dated, so uh, looking to get those updated through BC Housing. Mountain View, Ladysmith Intermediate, Dover Bay, Van <coughs> Barsby, North Oyster, Sports <coughs> Park. And uh, the School Enhancement Program is the next one on the list. Uh, we're about to submit a total of five projects <coughs> in total in this program. We, the project funding envelope is from between $100,000 to $3 million. Uh, so we've um, identified five different project or project <coughs> groupings uh, to go in this submission. Uh, the first one up would be phase two of the Hammond Bay CNCP HVAC upgrade, which is going to be constructed this summer. Uh, the balance of the funding would come out of the phase two ask. Uh, ministries indicated if they, fa if they fund a phase one of a project, they're very likely to phase or fund the phase two as they did last year with the Cedar water upgrade. Um, second is Park Avenue Elementary. Uh, we've got a pretty substantial H HVAC upgrade plan for that school. It's a large project. We've broken it up into three phases that we can do over three summers um, to reduce the funding ask so we can spread that out over more of our projects. Uh, we've bundled up the dust extractor replacements. Um, Dover and Wellington are going in this year. They're the next two largest high schools with the highest population. Uh, we're doing NDSS this year. Uh, that leaves Cedar, Ladysmith, and Wellington, or sorry, Barsby, sorry, to go in next year if we don't get this year. Uh, roofing, and we're putting in an ask for roofing, and then we bundled up some washroom renewal projects that I'll detail in later slides. So, Hem Bay, uh, phase two upgrades, a uh, budget of $350,000. We're basically ready to go with that as soon as we get the funding because we'd already tendered the project. <coughs> Park Avenue, three phases, uh, total budget of about 1.4 million. Uh, we're looking at doing a $600,000 phase one next summer. Uh, dust extractor, um, budget of $800,000. Once again, tender next spring, build next spring. Roofing, um, we've gone through and we've looked at our, we usually fund roofing out of AFG. Uh, typically on an annual basis and we've been pulling back on that every every so often just to make other projects happen so we've reinstated uh, six schools here that would bring us our annual program back up to around 2013 levels if we were to do the the annual program on a, on a 20 year cycle uh, those schools include Laplands, Fairview, Forest Park, Gabriela, Park Avenue and Rock City uh, we've left schools off the list that fall into that program that would be under a seismic mitigation. Uh, North Cedar would be on the list if there was no seismic pending. Uh, you can typically put in a, a roofing upgrade along with a seismic um, to reduce the seismic cost. You can upgrade the, the roofing structure as part of the seismic. Uh, washroom renewal is a new one for this year. They don't typically allow this category or was in introduced by the ministry. Um, so we put in a list of uh, NDSS, Barsby, Dover, Mountain View, Pleasant Valley, Pauline Hare uh, for washroom renewal, similar to what we did at Ladysmith Secondary this year, um, with an eye to possibly looking at doing a, an everyone washroom conversion in the process. The ministry did mention that in their, um, their webinar that that's something that they would look favorably on or might push your project over the approval desk faster. Uh, we're on to carbon neutral um, CNCP. We did get our Hammond Bay CNCP project funded last year. So like I mentioned, that is up for tender right now. Or sorry, the contract has been awarded and we're constructing that this summer into the fall. Uh, the next on the list would be a boiler replacement at Cedar Elementary, a uh, budget of $325,000. Um, bus replacement, um, transportation, uh, has indicated that uh, we don't need any bus replacements this year. Everything is 
in decent shape. No, nothing forecast until 2021 based on mileage and, and projection of usage. And that's kind of it. Thank you. Thank you guys for this. I, I guess yeah. um, before we go into the recommendation, does anybody have any questions? Trustee Finley? Uh, so, <coughs> AFG, does AFG go into any of these projects? Like, if you don't get your money through the five year capital plan, will AFG go towards any of these projects, or is AFG typically used for other things? Uh, the roofing ask if we, if we get none or portion, then AF, the AFG would supplement our roofing as well. We've got an annual program that's funded by AFG. If we can get funding elsewhere, that AFG can go to other long list of awaiting projects. And our AFG is usually what, around two and a half million? Yep. And, and we are considering a, a small contribution, offering the ministry a small contribution towards the, the boiler at Santa Barbara for the CNCP, just to see if we can motivate them. And then that would mean we don't take that out of our AFG in a future year. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right, uh, <coughs> Trevor. Um, how many, how many <coughs> other projects can we do in in house or like do we have the staffing roofing staff or engineer staff or like is there is there any cost savings with like these are multi-million dollar projects would there be any cost savings of actually having people in-house to do this stuff these are uh, these are great projects for the district to receive and uh, it's not likely that it will receive all five projects um, in, in our apps. However, we do have the ability either through district forces or through augmenting our district forces to deliver virtually anything the ministry approves. We just, we just need to strategically apply our forces or our contractability to that work. And yes, uh, there is work that, um, that we've been watching and piloting to see is it more effective to do with internal forces versus, with aug versus augmenting more external forces. And so we continue to, to monitor that. Market forces have a bearing on uh, on that as well. Okay. Uh, anybody else? Can I have a mover and a seconder for the recommendation? Moved by Trustee Solomon, trust, second by Trustee Robinson. Uh, any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? Carried unanimous. Thank you. Thanks for all your detailed hard work. Thanks very much. Thanks. Uh, Superintendent Blake. Oh. Page 115, the board requested uh, the updated amendment. And we also were needing to submit a brief. We just don't proceed. Mm -hmm. But uh, what I can report to you <laughs> is that uh, oh, why? Huh. when we put this together, the basic enrollment uh, of the update and the projection from now has remained the same. Uh, although there has been some adjustments to uh, level one, two, and three in the special uh, uh, special needs categories, and that was reflecting the uh, work that uh, Student Support Services did when they went out to look at all the IEPs and et cetera and the, and the students, and, uh, and and so that's in that reflection. So we our projections are still pretty strong. Um, we look at this year as a as a typical year where we will probably see quite a bit of uh, of uh, 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 quite a few students coming and going over the summertime. We feel that we will still be over, but uh, the indicators aren't strong enough for us yet to say how far we're going. So we're putting the same uh, enrollment in. So that's basically what all that small print shows you. And uh, what we can do is I'll get sent out to you in a larger uh, font. <laughs> or, or was it larger on your? Uh, it was a, it, it, on yeah, it? Yeah. Oh, okay. 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 I think on our on my computer I was able to see. Perfect. I'll double check. Okay. Yeah. So if you need it, let us know. Uh, but anyway, the, the bottom line is uh, projections are holding true. They're both the, the same as what uh, these numbers reflect exactly the same thing, except for uh, designated students. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, comments, or concerns? Seeing none, uh, no unfinished business. Any objection? Uh, sorry. I, <laughs> I, I well, I just wanted to. Yeah. And you might chime in too, but anyway. 
Um, I know you're, you're just about to move on. Oh, I'm sorry. 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 i am sorry i uh, I, I would just like to, uh, on behalf of, the, of myself and the work that we do here, to thank the staff here tonight and all the staff behind the scenes uh, to make these meetings occur. And uh, the, the support the, of, of the staff in the background in preparing information and et cetera. This is the last meeting of the year, and I don't know whether or not I'm preempting the, the chair, but this is from my end. Uh, particularly is that uh, background work is imperative that we can function here and uh, evenings are uh, are precious for all of us and uh, we really, I really do appreciate the time and, and short deadlines are, are something of a norm for all of us and uh, it is appreciated because all of us also understand what short deadlines do to us sometimes so thank you for sometimes my shortness and, <laughs> and uh, I really do appreciate the hard work thanks and just to dovetail on that, I just wanted to thank our staff and our board. I mean, this is another year, boy, it went very fast. Um, and thank you for everybody at this table's commitment, hard work, dedication to make this a better place for everybody. We don't always agree. Sometimes uh, our emotions get the better of us. But we always work towards a common goal, and I sincerely appreciate that. I have everybody sitting at this table. and to. To Izzy, thank you very much for all the hard work to put all these meetings together and to old Francis Lord Coppola back there. Thank you for uh, making this a movie that nobody can uh, turn down. <laughs> and uh, a special shout out to Bob. And yeah, uh, thank you to Bob. Very So uh, anyways, and thank you to our union presidents, Rob and Shannon, thank you for your commitment to this district and to make it a better place for everybody. So on that, uh, we have questions. We have one question. Uh, this is from Shannon. Uh, will the board write to the new government and express immediate need for fully funding the restored language and maintain the 2016-2017 service levels? Um, well, this is a labor relations issue. Uh, I think that this board and this staff are, have advocated and we do continue to advocate for fully funding this uh, uh, this obviously the lawsuit uh, the 2002 for 2002 language mandates that this goes forward and I also think that trustees trustee Bob's motion uh, that she made tonight will address this in September so thank you for your question uh, any, anybody have an objection to an adjournment Seeing none, have a great summer. Thanks, everybody.